Hi, welcome to trailer number 13, the Theory of Everything review. Specifically, we're going to be reviewing other theories of everything in preparation for the electrogravity paper release. And also, this video serves a secondary purpose, is to answer all those people that say, why don't you work with that other person? And I'll show you that working with other theorists is really not an option, and I'm going to explain why. So again, the purpose of this video is twofold. Because the electrogravity paper, which is part of the ethereal mechanics theory of everything, is going to be released in the next two months, I need a review of all prior art, which is a normal part of any kind of paper of this sort. Um, and so we're going to review all the other theories out there, both electrical, gravitational, and things that combine electric, other theories of everything, which combine the two. And second, to answer the many people ask, why don't you work with that other person? First, let's start with working with other people. Working with other people is only fruitful when the contributors share a common vision, like on a road trip. If you're going on a road trip, okay, we're going to share a car together, go on a road trip, and I want to go to Houston, and you want to go to New York. Well, our road trip together isn't going to last very long, because we have different visions of where we want to go. And the other thing about a road trip is each person or people working together need collaboratively need to sh need to be able to contribute complementary things. Like, for example, on a road trip, one person might decide that they're supplying the car and the other person decides, oh, well, we're going to I'm going to pay for the hotels because I need to stay at a particular kind of hotel and then we'll share the gas or something. They need to have complementary roles. For example, in songwriting, songwriter A might be the guy that did the lyrics and songwriter B did the melody. Or like in the Wright Brothers, it's suspected that Wilbur was actually the theorist while Orville oversaw the logistics, managed the finances, etc. Okay, you both can't bring a car. You both can't be theorists on flight together unless they share the complete vision. Uh, and then what's the point? If they're both sharing the same vision, why do we need two? Just like, why do you need two cars? Okay, and, and the reason why, especially like in songwriting, the reason why a lot of bands break up or have problems is because when they have a hit, they, they always argue over, well, I did the most contribution to the song, therefore I should get most of the credit or most of the, the proceeds and da, 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 da. And I have found that working with people long enough is everybody thinks that their contribution is the most. Um, in, in anything, even when like a relative dies, everybody thinks they should get the majority of the, if it's not specifically written in the will, everybody thinks that they deserve more than everybody else because everybody thinks they've contributed the most. It's amazing. It's amazing, you know, and that's probably why communism fails because everybody thinks their needs are bigger than everybody else's and therefore there's not enough to go around to fill everybody's inflated needs. Okay, um, and that's why Bands break up, uh, they split off into different bands, and that's why working with other people on a creative aspect is very, 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 very difficult, unless two creative people are contributing complementary ideas that dovetail and work nicely together. And I was going to use this map for an example of the road trip, and it 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 it, it pays because you know. Here we go. Let's say we're starting in LA and I want to go to New York, but you want to go to Texas. So how much are we going to actually get together before we split up? And there's a, there's a good analogy to this. Okay. Um, but one thing we must keep track of that any serious theory, okay, must contain both arguments and models. Okay. Arguments, Arguments are a logical causal argument detailing cause and effect. For an example, you could say New York is east of Los Angeles, therefore one must drive east from LA to get to New York. That's a logical argument. Okay, but you also need a model. Okay, a model, which is a means to determine quantifiable results from the theory in order to produce useful results. Like a model would be a map, let's say the US, which shows you how far it is from LA to New York so you can pick a route, the quickest route, 
and determine how many miles it's going to be, how much money you have to bring for gas, how many times you want to stay and what hotels you want to stay at, etc., etc., etc. Okay, if you do not do a map and you just try to wing it, it's going to be a disaster. And that's what a lot of theorists do. They just produce these arguments of what they think the theory of everything is. And the rest of and, and then if they really did models, they'd find out a lot of their, their arguments don't m mesh together well. Even And Tesla has a problem with this. And let me give you a very good example of winging it. Okay, there's a great, great Ken Burns documentary called Horatio's Drive. Okay, it's a, it's a saga about a 1903 guy, Dr. Nelson, Horatio Nelson Jackson, that in order to win a $50 bet, uh, drove a, an automobile from LA to New York City. Okay, and at that time, there were no maps of all the roads. Uh, there was no gas stations along the way. There was no such thing really as hotels. So he was completely winging it because there was no way he was going to do it. And this thing was a whole bunch of wrong turns, going down blind alleys, et cetera, et cetera. I think it cost him $16,000 to finally make the trip. And one of the funniest thing about this whole thing is uh, he got notoriety. In other words, he became a national sensation and didn't know it because he didn't pick up any of the news on it. And it became the point where Mercedes-Benz and a couple other car uh, manufacturers decided to get in on the race. And so they got their guy, their, their car started in LA trying to beat him across the country with all their support. They didn't win. And this guy ends up showing up in Los An uh, in New York City to a ticker tape parade that he had no clue what's going on. He thought it was just him going across the nation. It's a great, great thing. Now, I don't think this guy did it without a model. I think because according to the video, he was able to use the telegraph system to order gasoline and spare parts to arrive ahead of where he was going to be. So if I were him, I would just follow the telegraph lines across the nation. Okay, but they didn't mention that part, but that's what I would do. And because I would tell, I would, I would telegraph to this next station that says, hey, if I don't make it, I probably broke down send somebody back along the trail of the wire with a horse and, a, and a something to pull me and tow me up to the next, uh, next telegraph station so I can pick up my gas and spare parts that are arriving on the train or the stagecoach coming in. Because I don't think without the telegraph, there's no way he could have winged this. There's no way um, that, there's no way that could have been done without the telegraph. And the telegraph became his model that we just follow the telegraph wires. Now they didn't mention that in the video, but I'm sure that's what he did because I don't see any, any way else he could have figured out how to go from point A to point B. Especially if he had to telegraph stuff, the best way to tell everybody is in, in all your major, the telegraph followed all your major routes of stagecoach and trains. So it makes sense if he should have followed the telegraph. But anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. Okay, and this is just a redefinition of models, arguments, and theories. Again, a good theory is an argument supported by models or a model supported by arguments. It doesn't really matter. Now, I have a thing called a ghost story, which arguments without models, which is most of the things that I'm reviewing are ghost stories. Okay, arguments without models are very, very shoddy, okay? And a lot of their arguments are, are inconsistent, but we'll, we'll go over those in a little more detail. And now the, other, the third one is an empirical model. It's a model developed from an empirical observation without arguments to explain how or why it happens. A good example of empirical models are many of the electromagnetic equations from Maxwell, like, for example, Coulomb's model. Coulomb's model is an empirical model because it's a curve fit of empirical data. It doesn't explain how the spooky action at a distance occurs. All it says is that it does occur. And we support those spooky action at a distance models with these flux models. We have magnetic and electric flux models, which are derived from the models themselves. They, are not, they were not developed out of argument. They were just developed from the models. And so I know there's a lot of people that are trained saying, no, there's great theory on these things. No, there's not. There is not. There is no explanation of what an, an electric field is, how it gets from point A to point B. At least in ethereal mechanics, I can show you a good derivation that shows you can derive an electric field from a magnetic field and get exactly the right answer. It explains where the C squared comes from, where nobody else does, but I'm going off on a tangent. 
Okay, um, just read this page on your own. Uh, I was going to do a quick overview here, but I decided to do a more exhaustive overview after we cover all of the theory. So you can read this page on your own. We're going to go into more detail on this later. So this is the general overview of all of the theories. Some are just electric, some are just gravity, some are electrogravitic. Okay, at the top here, okay, at the top, we have ethereal mechanics, which has an argument, it has a model, it has a model of gravity, model of inertia, it has electromagnetism, slightly different from Maxwell's equation, especially on the magnetic side. It has a model of matter, model of matter, and that model of matter is what's called a second order system of pretons. Pretons are inertialist charged particles, but their charge is not electric charge, their charge is magnetic charge. Not magnetic monopoles. Magnetic monopoles are nonsense. These are magnetic charges. Charges as they move through the medium, they generate an electric field. Uh, I'm sorry, magnetic field. Those are what magnetic charges are. It has an ether model. Essentially that the pretons as they move create a vector ampere field. And it shows that inertia, induction, and essentially gravity are all the same. Okay, then you have relativity. Oh, and let me show you these red boxes here. Okay, these, these to me are the things that are showstoppers for these models. The things that are not going to let these models achieve a theory of everything status because they're missing. Relativity does not have a model of matter. Okay, unless you can get a model of matter, any, any models of gravity are useless. Well, no, I, that's overstatement. They're useful, but you're not going to get much farther than that. That's a better way to say it. So we're not going to discuss relativity any further. Then there's a new book called Dynamic Ether of Cosmic Space by uh, James DeMeo Fudd. Uh, and he comes in with a dynamic ether model. So he has an argument, but he has no mathematical models at all. No models that describe the behavior. You say, well, this is a PhD. Normally, PhDs fill up their book with mathematical equations, even equations they don't understand just to impress people of how smart they are. There's not one stinking model in this book. It is all arguments. Okay, and his model for gravity and the ether are okay. They're, they're strange, but he has no model for inertia, no model of matter. Does not discuss really electromagnetism and much other than discussing the light in the michelson morley experiment. Um, so it's eh, it's basically just a ghost story. Tesla, Tesla, in my opinion, had the best, well, the most coherent story. But and we're going to go into Tesla and DeMeo in a little more detail later. So, uh, but let's just generally go over it now. Tesla does not have any models for this. This model, which discusses the ether in terms of matter, elect uh, inertia and gravity and all that stuff is basically just a story. He did not do any modeling of it. Had he done some modeling of it, he'd found out this pretty much it's going to be inconsistent. And we'll explain that when we get to more detail. Okay, but he doesn't have any models. Had he had some models, he probably would have made some different choices and stuff. Okay, his model of matter is really not a model. It's basically an argument of matter. In other words, he doesn't do a model. He just basically says that matter is basically an, uh, uh, a, a construct of ether without any real model. Okay, then you have Ken Wheeler. Ken Wheeler does a lot of borrowing from Eric Dollard, which we'll discuss in a moment. So a lot of the dielectricity that Ken Wheeler talks about was actually um, described first by Dollard, because I didn't know what Ken Wheeler meant when he said dielectricity. I looked it up. And Dollar talked about dielectricity, but Dollar talked about dielectricity in terms of what Tesla was doing, which really Tesla didn't talk in terms of dielectricity. So, but anyway, we're going to go into more detail on a review video of Dollar and, and, and Wheeler anyway. As to say that for the most part, uh, Wheeler just talks about matter and ether. And because he referenced Tesla, we have to make the assumption that his models of, because he doesn't really discuss them, they're just talked about in passing, that they must be Tesla's models. The only thing Ken Wheeler does really, other than talk about uh, dielectricity and all that stuff, is add his dielectric component 
to the model for light. So he takes Maxwell's model of light and adds the dielectric component as a longitudinal component. And again, we'll talk about that more when we get into uh, the review of the, the Ken Wheeler stuff, the stuff that's going to only be for Patreon members. Okay, but short of that, he doesn't really give any model for, the other models are more in keeping with what Tesla said. Okay, Maxwell, Maxwell, he did have an ether model early on, but they got abstracted or taken away uh, when Heaviside translated everything. So I, what I'm going to do is I do have books that discuss, I need to go over those and do some re more research on those. But I, as I remember the last time I did this, uh, they were nothing much to speak about. Um, so, uh, and really Maxwell stuff, they have models that are basically supported by abstraction. There's no argument, again, like I said before, there's no argument that explains what an electric field is. Oh, it's a bunch of lines, but those are abstractions. Those field lines are no more real than the contour lines on a topographical map. They're abstractions that help you use the model better. They are not an argument. Okay? They are not trying an expl a causal explanation of what a charge emits that, that transverses across space that affects the other charge. So essentially, Maxwell is spooky action at a distance. And we eliminate that in ethereal mechanics because we explain uh, what fields are, how they're manifested in the ether, how they propagate, etc., etc., etc. Now, the electric universe is a is a is a crazy bunch of people that are kind of under one umbrella. Uh, I don't know really how coherent they are. They have a model of gravity, but it's like the dipole, electric dipoles inside the protons which is weird, it's strange, which basically it says that um, gravity is electrostatic attraction, which is complete nonsense. Um, gravity cannot be electrostatic attraction because you already have something for electrostatic attraction. You can't have, it's oversubscribed. Okay, and they their model for electromagnetism, it's pretty much they say they're the same as Maxwell, except they say the electric field travels faster than the speed of light. Or ethereal mechanics, we say no, no, no. The electric field is just a magnetic field in disguise. It cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So we're very different on this, okay? Uh, and they pretty much say everything in the universe is electric plasma. They claim to have an ether model. I really couldn't find any coherent reference to ether. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, I'm not really keen on these guys. Uh, but it's up to you. If you feel they're good, then please go support them. Eric Dollard, I have to give a little honorable mention to. Um, although he claims to be an electrical engineer, he's really not. He's a, probably a technician that learned a little bit of math, and that's why I gave him a little star under models, because at least he tried to develop models. Made a lot of mistakes, but he tried, so I give him a little bit of credit on that. Uh, basically, what he did, he took uh, Tesla's experiments of transmitting waves from one plate to another which he calls dielectricity which would be dielectricity if there really were dielectric in there so it's really just electrical field lines he's talking about you know whatever you call them it doesn't matter as long as you get good results but his models and he comes he's the ones that comes up with the scalar wave stuff which is uh he's not really doing the math right um but you know what uh, at least his writing is a little bit more coherent than Ken Wheeler. Uh, Ken Wheeler has a fantastic vocabulary, uh, but he makes a lot of contradictions in his theory. And he does weird things and argues semantics. Like he'll say, oh, scientists don't know what they're talking about. Space doesn't have properties. Space has attributes. And he'll say things like that, which are ridiculous. You know, a rose by any other name smells just as sweet. Don't argue semantics. And please don't tell me what it is. Tell me what it does. He doesn't do any of that. He just tells you what it is. He says, oh, this is the dielectric, uh, the electric inertia dielectric plane or whatever. He uses all these words, but it doesn't tell you what it does. Okay. Fancy words don't mean much unless you can explain what it does. How can I use it? How can I build something with it? You can't do that when you only have a ghost story. Okay. At least Eric Dollar tried. And his electromagnetic theory is not much different than, Ma than Maxwell's, except that he goes in to try to explain the existence of scalar waves, which I disagree with, but whatever. 
Now, quantum mechanics and the standard model to me are basically uh, the two twisted sisters. I don't believe they are going anywhere. Um, I've done a lot of videos on quantum mechanics to show pretty much that their quantum entanglement is baloney. Their particle wave duality is a misinterpretation of standard uh, physical properties. It's, it's just insane. And I got a couple of videos out there. I, the T8 and T12 come to mind. I don't, the links will be in the low bar for those who want to see those. Okay, uh, Edward Leeds Gallen. Okay, he's, uh, I have his book. He's very difficult to read because he doesn't speak English well. He doesn't write English well. But once you understand his broken English, it's pretty easy to follow his book. Um, if he did, he's claimed that he moved like, you know, multi, 20 ton or 30 ton blocks of coral by himself. And people claim that he had the secrets of the pyramids and how he did it. Well, if he did have that, it was not in his book. Okay, his book was basically good observation of, of regular experiments. Um, and he came to an interesting conclusion that electricity is magnetic gyros, which is really interesting. This is very close to pretons because in a second order system of pretons, which is a spinning system of magnetic charges, okay, that's very, very close. That's what an electric charge is. It's a spinning spinning pair of magnetic charges. So it's interesting that he came up with that. I don't know from his book. He did not give us the logic, logical argument how he got from got to that. He just said that's what it is. Whereas in the theory of mechanics, I give you the logical argument how you get from what we knew and say this is that, that has to be this because of this, then this is that, then that is that, and you get to magnetic charges. Okay, and the other problem with his magnetic gyros is he requires magnetic gyros of opposite polarities to be uh, moving in opposite directions where ethereal mechanics, uh, your electron, which is a second order system of preton, is the only thing that moves in, the, in, a, in a standard wire. Okay, now I give him credit here for having models only because he made an argument and then he proved the argument with a an experiment. He didn't take any measurements, so he doesn't really have a model, but he does good observations of his experiments. Okay, without models, I can't make any, I can't do anything to repeat his experiments. I mean, I mean, to make anything quantifiable from it. So I give him a lot of credit, but you know, it's one of those things without models, I can't, we can't go anywhere with it really. And if my Patreon members want, we can go over this book. The book is not long. It's not copyrighted. Uh, but, you know, I will go over it for Patreon members only if they choose. Uh, I'm not going to spend time on it unless it's people that, you know, are my Patreon members. I'll spend time on them. I'm not going to spend time for the average Joe YouTube subscriber on this because this is really not, in my opinion, worth my time unless my Patreon subscribers want it. Okay, then we have Jeff Emenko. Um, and I, it's a little bit heavy side because Jeff Emenko took something from heavy side and ran with it. Uh, Jeff Emenko, in my opinion, is very, very, very smart. He's a person who understands electromagnetic theory as at least as good as I do, except that he went off into the weeds. And we're going to discuss him in a little more detail a little later. Okay, but his, he does not have a, he does not discuss inertia at all. He does not have a model of matter. Again, just like relativity, he treats matter as a ubiquitous value that goes into an equation. There is no model to the matter itself. And he does an interesting thing where he does a parallel development of gravity with a co-gravitational field and comes out with equations that look just like Maxwell's equations. It's very interesting, but it's completely ridiculous. Um, but I'm going to give him credit because in the beginning, he came close to having the right answer. I mean, he touched the right answer. But because it was, and I can, sh we're going to show you that in this video, that if he just reduced that to its basic form, the answers would have been right in front of his face. But he didn't do that. Okay, and he went off on this deep end with co-gravitation. But anyway, we're going to talk that in a little bit more. So, in the next few slides, or after the next few slides, we're going to do a quick comparison of the different ether models, and then we're going to do a comparison of ethereal mechanics to Jeff Emenko. But right now, I'm going to show the 
comparison videos are the review videos that will be present for Patreon members only. Okay, the first review video will be a combined review of Tesla, Dollard, and Wheeler. Uh, we're not going to, you know, publish a lot of their work as copyright. We're just going to review some of the theories in the books. And it's interesting here because Eric Dollard made sure that he put quotation marks when he called himself a wireless engineer in 1986. Nowadays, he calls himself a electrical engineer. The problem I have with that is you're, when people make up credentials like that, when they call themselves a PhD, when they're not a PhD, is when you start lying like that, how do I know that you're even truthful on your theory? If you have a good theory, it doesn't matter who you are. Remember, the Wright brothers didn't go to college and they invented electrical engineering. Okay, Heaviside did not go to college and he is the father of everything we pretty much do in electrical engineering. Okay, the guy that invented the wheel did not go to college to learn how to invent the wheel. Um, everybody that basically made a big contribution in science did not have the ability. You could not have the ability to go train in something to invent it. Okay, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, you know, so it doesn't matter. There's a lot of cases, you know, I mean, Edison didn't go to college and look at all the great things he invented. If you have a good theory, the theory should stand on its own. Okay, but you got to learn the math. The Wright brothers, they learned how to do the math. Heaviside learned how to do the math. He even invented math to make it work. Okay, because once you do the models, you can, other people can then can take your ideas and build things and make more efficient things with them. Okay, so the models are just as important as the arguments. Okay, the number two video was we're going to review the James DeMeo PhD book, or James DeMeo FUD book. Um, yeah. The third one, we're going to do Jeff Emenko just a little bit toward the beginning. You can see here he's got Maxwell's equation, and then he came up with a co-gravitational equation that looks just like the Maxwell equation. Unfortunately, this is wrong, wrong. And unfortunately, he had the right idea why this should be wrong, but why is it printed here? I mean, he's like smart. He knows this stuff. Okay, so I don't know. Unless, of course, well, anyway, we're going to discuss this in more detail when we get to this video. Now, it's interesting. I went in, when I went to go get the screenshot of that book cover, I found out he had two other books. So I ordered this book, uh, $94, and we'll do a re I have to review that one. Okay, this one I want to review, but I'm not going to spend $916 on it because this is doing his gravitation co-gravitation thing. I don't I don't subscribe to the co-gravitation nonsense. I subscribe to the ether as the gravitational field okay this is as a reminder jeff emenko is a non-ether guy okay he's trying to explain gravity because it's two separate fields just like electromagnetism is two separate fields which can be described without having to describe ether and there you could say it's ether but it doesn't matter so why discuss ether so he's not an etherist so now we're going to do a uh, quick comparison of the different ether models that are out there because ether is where we're going okay if ethereal mechanics which is me where is my mouse there it is okay in ethereal mechanics massive bodies consume ether ether is the fuel of existence of massive bodies of matter and just like fuel that's like water going down a drain it'll eventually set up an irrotational vortex not irrotational flow irrotational vortex and that's why galaxies kind of get their shape. That's why solar systems and all kinds of other things happen. And when you see the, gra the theorem mechanics, the electrogravity paper, it'll make perfect sense. If you want to, go to my website, www.stinty.com. There's the original paper from 1999 called newgravity.pdf. It's free. Go look at it. The, the electrogravity paper is going to be the next evolution of that with some things that are corrected. Like when I wrote that paper, I did not know why, I, I, a reason that gravity had to be flowing spirally down to bodies, but I didn't understand why. 
In electrogravity, I explain why and the mechanisms of why, how much, the whole nine yards. Okay, Tesla basically says that matter is a bubble in the ether, and matter is a lot less dense than the ether. Basically, the analogy he uses is that when you boil water, you get bubbles in the water. Those water, those bubbles are water vapor. In other words, uh, this would be, matter would be ether in vaporeal form. Okay, and which means that there's pressure of the ether trying to close that bubble. And that pressure is what he explains is the force of gravity. And we'll get, that's an, actually another slide. The classical ether model is that matter and ether coexist as separate unrelated entities except for the transmission of light. But in their model, ether just passes completely through, one passes completely through the other, they don't affect each other, and the ether is completely static. I shouldn't have shown I shouldn't have shown the ether moving because the ether is static. That's my mistake. It should have been that the mass is moving through the ether. Sorry about that. Okay, DeMeo says that the ether is dynamic and it's moving, and it's actually crashing into the earth. Okay, but it's not very dense. It, it doesn't. It's, the velocity stops within a few feet under the ground of the earth. I don't know how he found that out, how he came to that conclusion, but that's what he says and he also says that the matter is attracted or the ether is attracted to matter but they coexist as separate entities if they're attracted they're, how, I don't know okay matter ether relative densities in ethereal mechanics the ether is incredibly dense super dense where matter is virtually non-existent virtually non-existent. I have a video called Ghosts in the Ether to explain that, that we are nothing but ghosts. We virtually do not exist. What we think is hot, solid objects is like the ash from those, you know, those, uh, those fireworks you get, those snakes, when you set the fire to the snake, you get this ash that's very thin and wafty, but a good puff of air will disintegrate it. Well, that's exactly the relation between the ether being the breath of air and matter, the ash. The matter is virtually non-existent. Okay, and Tesla, ether is thousands of times more dense than air. Again, he's got no models. But again, if matter is a um, bubble of vaporeal ether, then obviously matter is a lot less dense than the ether. Classical ether, Matter is dense and ether is aeroform, which means very fine gas, much, much finer. So the classical ether model is opposite to both Tesla and Distinti. DeMeo claims ether penetrates all throughout matter, but ethereal velocities from the earth moving through the ether or the ether moving through the earth penetrate no further than a few feet underground. So it would seem that matter is much more dense because if you can block, if, if if it penetrates through all of matter, but matter can stop its velocity, then matter has to be dense. Again, he gives no models. This is all logic. Without models, it's kind of like hit or miss of what the real relationship is. Matter, ether, relative motion, density. Okay, in the in the in the previous in the previous uh, diagrams, I show the ether flowing in in a spiral because those spiral motions are a lot of complex motions all messed together. What it is in those spiral motions, the actual vector of acceleration is of the vector acceleration is virtually radial. There's a slight, slight tangential component, but substantially radial. So the ether accelerates toward massive bodies uh, and the ether starts flowing faster with less density and pressure as you get closer. That's the difference here is, according to Tesla, is you have higher pressure uh, near the bubble and lower pressure as you get farther away. For classical ether model, there's no change in ether behavior relative to the massive body. There was a theory about ether dragging, but they never went anywhere with that. So by the classical model, the ether and the matter just pass through each other. There's no real effect, no change in density, nothing. Uh, except for whatever ether is displaced by the massive body. So you might even say the ether gets less dense inside the massive body. Okay, and for DeMeo, 
uh, ether increases in density and pressure toward the massive body because they're attractive. So both Tesla and DeMeo, ether gets more dense toward the massive body, whereas in ethereal mechanics, it's the opposite. Ether density reduces toward the massive body, obviously because the massive body is consuming the ether. So if you're consuming the ether, you're going to deplete the ether, and that depletion forces other ether to flow toward the depression to, to satiate the massive object. Inertia. Okay, classically, either modelers, they never got that far. DeMeo, no mention of, e of inertia at all. Tesla. Tesla says pushing a body through the ether builds up a wake due to compression. Now, if he did really did any kind of modeling on this, he would have found out that this is really inconsistent with observation. But again, Tesla just did a lot of jaw jacking on this. I couldn't find any models at all. Uh, in ethereal mechanics, when you push on a block through the ether, you're basically accelerating the block this way. But relative to the block, the ether is accelerating this way. And therefore, the force is going to be in the direction of the ether accelerating through the block, which is going to give you the inertial force that's going to oppose the applied force here. And that's how inertia works in ethereal mechanics. And that inertia is due to the electromagnetic induction between the pretons that make up the matter. It's very simple. It's so simple, even a physicist can do it. Gravity. Tesla. Or battery, yeah, let's start down here. Uh, classic, they never got that far. DeMeo, gravity is three-body phenomenon. It is so ridiculous. He basically says that the reason why the moon is attracted to the earth is because the sun is there. It is so stupid. I'm sorry. Um, I, his PhD is in some kind of, well, you know what? We're getting more into him when we do the full review of his book for the Patreon members. But his PhD is not in, in, in physical sciences. Okay, and Tesla, ether increases in density pressure toward massive bodies. And he's saying because of that, that's how bodies are attracted. Now, there was another theorist who came up with a model that says the electrical pressure or the cosmic ray pressure, same kind of idea, just not with the ether, but the model was thrown out for being really inconsistent. There's no way you could you could explain it that way. Um, and it didn't fit, okay? Again, that theory was came forward, I believe, before Tesla. Had Tesla looked it up and looked how much it compared to his use of the ether, he would have seen that his ether model would be just as inconsistent as that other model. Okay, ethereal mechanics. Just like inertia, Okay, we have massive bodies that are consuming the ether and it causing the ether to accelerate toward the massive body. So an object that's near that massive body will experience ether accelerating through it to get to the planet. And again, the force acting on this block is going to be in the direction of the ether accelerating through it to the point that the falling object will match the acceleration of the ether flowing toward the massive body and the ether accelerates toward the earth at 9.86 meters per second squared and the full velocity of the ether at the earth's surface is about 11,000 meters per second inward so the earth consumes a hell of a lot of ether to maintain its stability and it's not very stable oh you know what i'm not going to go that far with you you need to we need to keep on track here with what we're reviewing Okay, the ethereal mechanics goes into long depth about cores and expanding planets. There's a video out there somewhere in the video number 23 or 4, somewhere in there that explains that the Earth was much, much smaller and that's been expanding. That Pangaea was actually the surface of the entire Earth many, many, many billions of years ago. Okay, not that it was one continent on Earth, but it was the size of the Earth. And that the Earth has been expanding ever since. And I'm not the first person to say the Earth was expanding either. There was there was geologists in the 1800s that said the Earth was expanding, and people shot them down. And says, "Where's all the mass coming from?" Because all these physicists have it in their mind that if something is bigger, it must be more massive. That's not the case. Because if you look at popcorn, when popcorn pops, 
its volume gets bigger, but its mass goes down. And that's what's happening with nuclear fission going on in the Earth's core. When you have nuclear fission, the components that come out of the fission okay, produce a lot of energy and they have more volume but less mass than the original components. Okay, but they don't seem to connect that. But anyway, going off on a tangent. Now we're going to get into Jeff Emenko. Now, when I first read Jeff Emenko back in 2000, I think, which is about a year after I came out with my electrogravity paper and about four years after I came out with new induction, I read through the book and said, gee, uh, I couldn't, I, I went past this page and I did not recognize this because at that time in my evolution, I wasn't as good at reading math as I am now. And I reread it again and said, holy crap. He, if he, oh, on page 29, he had very close to the right answer. This is, this, this is actually mathematically the same as this. But because he didn't reduce this to a point charge equation like I did, he couldn't see it. He couldn't see it. This obscures the truth. Okay, this is a mask on the truth. When you reduce this to this, you can see F equals MA right here in front of your face to see that induction is inertia. Induction is inertia. And then once you get to the inertia part, you can say, gee, matter looks like it's constructed by a pair of charges separated by a distance and you start making models and it's amazing how wonderful it works you can't see that with this nonsense over here you can't okay and then you it's amazing and then this once you start thinking about gravity and einstein's principle equivalence like hey there must be an ether because i wasn't an etherist until i got this far and said hey how do we explain gravity the only way you can do it is with a medium that accelerates earthward and that's from this that's how i got there because at this reduced form you can see you can see nature right there this he couldn't see it but he had it instead of going the right way like i did he went the wrong way from this point and in fact he says down here in his book uh, just before page 29 he says electromagnetic induction is actually a misnomer since no magnetic effect is involved in the phenomena we will hold on a minute this my friends is the magnetic field constant i don't know what this guy's thinking because you know why he i have to go out back and find out but he basically derives this nonsense from electrostatic models and now I'm saying to myself, well, there has to be some really bad funking business going on if he got a magnetic field. But so let me just back up. So Jeff Fomenko derives a correct mimic of induction from an electric field. Somehow I need to go find out how he got there because there might be some interesting stuff there because I think he quotes a lot of other people on how he got here. And because he derived it from an electric field, he thinks this is an electric field. Whereas I did experiments and I had the computer basically give me this and say, I want, you know, and then I, I gave, the computer gave me some vector equations and I reduced the vector equations to the simplest form, which is this. And from that, I was able to see all the brilliant simplicity right in front of me. But I went the other way and I said, well, no, this is a, this basically says everything is magnetic and I'm able to derive the electric field from this magnetic model here. So, he went from the electric field to something that was very close to the proper model of induction. I went from a model of induction that derived completely from experiment and was able to derive the electric field. Completely opposite directions. Let's keep on up. But then, you know, we got close and he went off into the weeds. Because if you look at his preface, which should be kind of a synopsis of his whole book, he says, but why would one discuss induction and gravitation in the same book? He said, there is no direct connection, but I have found that there's a very strong indirect, indirect connection between induction and gravitation, okay? Where in ethereal mechanics, I show that induction, inertia, and gravity are exactly the same thing. 
as I've explained in this video already. It's very simple, very, very simple, but you need an ether to make it all happen. The ether is the glue that makes all these things the same. Okay, but Jeff Emenko does not discuss matter or just does not discuss inertia at all. He does discuss electromagnetic momentum, but it's weird. Okay, and he, again, matter is not, he does not have a model of matter. Again, just like relativity, matter is this constant you, that, you, uh, that you dump into equations. Whereas ethereal mechanics has a model of matter which shows all these mechanisms to be related because the model of matter is shown right here. It is two inertialist charges separated by a distance that co-orbit each other. It's a beautiful model. It's a sweet model. It's so simple, a physicist can do it. Okay, and so when you, like I've said in my other videos, when you reduce the models down to their simplest form, you should be able to see the simple structures of nature. Okay, Jeff Emenko left it in a very complex way, and that's a problem with a lot of physicists I have, because he's actually a professor, or was a professor in West Virginia University, and it is a love complicated thing because it makes him look intelligent. I am sorry. When you boil things down to their simplest form, you can see Mother Nature right in front of you. So, in conclusion, sorry this is a very long video. Uh, the completion of the ethereal mechanics electrogravity paper is a primary objective of my work at this time. The only videos, the only videos that will support that completion of that project will be produced until after it's produced. Okay, this video does prior art review, which is necessary for any scientific paper. And the electrogravity paper will contain a section that essentially repeats the material contained in this video, maybe with a little bit better uh, writing and diction than this off the cuff. I basically done this thing without rehearsal from beginning to end. And so far, I haven't made a mistake. Well, a couple of little mistakes. Okay. Other than the review videos mentioned previously and a few rules of actualization videos, which are also related to support the EG paper, nothing else will be produced. To my Patreon folks, be patient. I want to get the uh, electrogravity paper done in the next couple of months. So don't expect much of me other than those things we discussed until then. After that, once the electrogravity paper is off my plate, watch the stuff that's going to happen. We're going to start running right into and finding that last little piece. We're going to just go right into the railgun project because we need to have something that's going to verify that the new electromagnetism models are complete. And the railgun is the best way to prove that the models are complete because if the railgun doesn't give us the exact results that the physics software tells us and we know something's missing. Okay, it is the best way to do that. And our railgun is going to be different than anybody else's railgun. You will not believe how different it is. Okay, also, for those people that say you should work with that other person, I hope it's clear that just because two entities discuss ether, it does not mean that they are even remotely working toward the same vision. And I hope this review of the various theories gives you an appreciation of the vast differences that are out there. But this is good, okay? Because as George Patton said, if everyone's thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. And if we're all thinking alike, then the probability is we're all gonna be going down the wrong bunny trail, the wrong path. When we're all going in different directions, the probability that somebody's going to trip over the truth is higher if we're all going different directions. Okay, so us working together is not really helpful. It's actually going to stifle uh, people going their own different way because somebody is going to be going in the right direction. Hopefully it's me. So I ask you to support which entity you feel has the closest vision of the truth. And because, like I've said, your lives may depend on on my T1 Break the Light Barrier Parish video in my trailer, look under uh, the YouTube for trailers, um, I basically make a logical argument that we have to break the light barrier by at least a factor of 500 or we are going to perish. Anything that anybody does right now, we're far beyond the capa sustainable capacity of the earth. We are, we are able to do that because of oil. The minute the oil stops flowing, it's going to be mass famine and the, the sustainable population of the earth I have deduced uh, a comfortable sustainable is 90% uh, reduction at current levels a minimum bare existence uh, it would be 80% of of uh, is 80% yeah it's 80% of, of reduction in existing population levels 
And I think the United Nations says that 75% reduction is in order. So uh, my models are good. It, 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 the way I did them there, also if you take 40 acres and a mule and you divide the number of square acres of land by 40 acres and assume that the 40 acres and a mule for a four person family, you get very close to my number. So I can get my number a lot of different ways. So unless we break the light barrier, okay, that's our only hope for the future. And I'm the only one saying this, and I'm the only one who seems to have a coherent way of doing it. Um, so please help out. You can go to the, um, pay to the uh, my site, which is at distinti.com. This site is being maintained as a repository of all of the different papers and videos. It's still under construction. It's not complete. It's not up to date, but it's getting there. So you can see who I am, what my background is, where the different areas that I'm working in, the, and the, the things that are presently available to everybody. Um, you can also go to uh, ethereummechanics.info, which is our blog being managed by Sebastian. Sebastian's doing a good job of keeping everybody up to praise when the latest um, things are out, whether it's on the Patreon side or whether it's on the YouTube side. So this, I would recommend people, if you're not interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, I think going to the Ethereal Mechanics Info is the best because there's lots of discussions of, of people that follow me. I don't get on there much because I'm so busy doing the work. I'm sorry. After we get the electrogravity paper out, I'll, I'm going to make it a point to spend more time on the blog and more time answering the emails on the Patreon site. If you want to support us directly, if you go to distinctive.com, you can just give me a donation through PayPal or you can go to the uh, Patreon site, which is ethereummechanics.com. You know, the only difference is com and info here. And we have different levels. Uh, and, and you can, if you want to just send a few dollars a month to support, that's fine, but we have pay, passenger level, uh, first class passenger level, engineer level, and bridge officer level memberships. Um, I've been neglectful of my Patreon folks right now because they understand I'm trying to get the electrogravity paper out. Once we do that, I'll have a lot more time. I get this pressure off my, this is a big paper, requires lots of simulations. And the cool thing about the Patreon site is, for example, if you sign up to be an engineer, you get access to all the source code of all the simulations. Okay, if you're a first class passenger, uh, you can get executables, not the source code, just the executables of all the simulations and you can also have access to all the PDFs and Excel spreadsheets that are produced. Uh, passenger level, you just get uh, access to any of the videos that are related to the science. Uh, we do have certain videos related to, um, uh, you know, things for things for bridge officers only, like it's not science, it's more of, you know, where we're going to go, what we should do, questions and answers and uh, things like that. You know, in other words, non-scientific, the more administrative videos, let's say it that way. So thank you for my Patreon folks. I really appreciate your patience. This thing is coming along. Um, you're going to see again in the next couple of weeks, the reviews of the other guys. Um, and again, this video is part of the production of the paper because we have to do review of prior art to make sure that we are different from everybody else. So no one can claim I'm stealing their idea because as you can see, my ideas are very different than theirs. Anyway, I want you to have a good night. Sorry, I did not realize this video would have gone 53 minutes. I think this is the longest video we got, but there's a lot of information in it. Uh, thank you all very much. <laughs>